Hello and welcome back to AIBC Summit YouTube channel. Now the DeFi trend has been surging in 2020 and the DeFi market hit an all-time high this September. Currently now it surpasses 7.5 billion US dollars. While Steve Good, author of Amazon bestseller Be Left Behind, now shares some insights on where the DeFi industry is heading. Steve, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you doing? Good. Good. Very good. And we have an interesting topic at hand as well, so it's even better. And I think we've been we having do. these interviews for, for years now, and you are a regular at our conferences, and I had to get you on the line to talk about some of these DeFi breakouts that we are seeing in the industry and just get some of your insights on what are some of the main benefits that we are seeing sure. in the DeFi space. It seems to be very bullish at the moment. Yeah, I mean, the bullishness is interesting. It reminds me a little of the... Um, the 2016, 2017 ICO, you know, startup of the whole crypto, you know, excitement that we saw. Um, I think this is a little bit different. There's a, definitely a hype element going on that's driving projects up and getting people excited and putting money into it, and driving the price up. But the difference now, I think, is there's a reality here, which is that products are actually there and working. And there's a range of services that are coming out from loans to farming, yield farming or creating these kind of liquidity pools to different types of synthetics, to even some stuff in the, the gaming space. So it's a bit different because there's actually some, the beginnings of where we're seeing some light of the tunnel here that there's actually real products. So there is the, the bullish momentum and the optimism that we saw a few years back, but actually there's a little bit more tangible investments when it comes to actually being able to get to grips on the projects and, and some of the interesting totally. developments that we are seeing underway. So one project that I do want to ask you about is, is Yearn, because it seems to be this DeFi gateway service that everyone really yes, is talking everyone's about. Everyone's excited that, about it. Yeah, so the YFI token achieved a new record high of 38,000 US dollars per token. I know. Market How did we miss surpassed. it? <laughs> <laughs> How did we miss it? And I want to get your insights uh, and have a breakdown on this because this is getting a lot of attention. Uh, what is yeah. your perception of the project? Well, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, if you try to look at the website and go through it like a layman trying to figure it out, it's not easy. And a lot of the, the DeFi projects are also kind of taking this more technical slant, and that's not helping. But when you look under the covers of what Yearn is doing, or why Yearn Finance, what, what's really interesting is how they've integrated with a variety of other products in the market for trading and for loans and interest and borrowing. So just bringing them together and then being able to provide some dynamic services where if one you know, choice you've made isn't working, it'll dynamically switch to others. So it's bringing a little bit of automation and a little bit of intelligence to the, the decision-making process to optimize your growth. And I think that's what people like is the ability to borrow if they need to borrow or earn if they want to earn, but it's done in a smart way. And they've got, you know, they're, they're, a lot of the products are still beta, but they're talking about, you know, borrowing, they've got interest, they've got loans, they've got insurance. And that starts to cover a pretty good range of things that you know are still in, in their infancy, but show some real promise in terms of what could be done. And they're you know cutting edge because they're bringing things together rather than doing their own thing, which I like. It's really cool. Really cool. And I think what's really interesting about this project in particular, but actually a lot of the DeFi space is a lot of the people that you will see that create video content on YouTube and Twitter, for example, are really huge advocates for this financial freedom when it comes to borrowing and lending. Uh, and it sounds perfectly like Yearn is, is an example, and there's a lot of other tokens out there as well. So is there any other tokens at the moment that are kind of catching your interest or any other projects that you are quite optimistic that might have a, a positive future when it comes to actually integration yeah i mean um there's a few different things i like for a lot of different reasons i mean urine covers a range of things um the insurance space is one that's you know probably the more difficult one to crack but you know at least urine's trying to do something there um when you get into things like the the, the loan space you have compound um when you want to get into things like uh uniswap for swapping one coin to another and working in liquidity pools or if you want to swap uh, stablecoin to stablecoin with Curve, um, all really interesting examples of, of things that are going on that are really you know, unique. And then there's also some stuff I'm seeing in kind of the gaming space now where, you know, almost creating yield farms or, oh, hello, my little boy just had to <laughs> come and say hi. <laughs> 
<laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> the future investor. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah. But you get some stuff like Just Bet, which is a new project, which is doing some things around yield farming of the, the actual back end reserve. So, and then there's synthetics, which I really like. Synthetics is really interesting because what they've done is create a synthetic instrument to trade against a real um, asset like Apple or Microsoft or gold or Bitcoin so that you don't have to have the underlying asset. You have a derivative, which is a synthetic asset. Really interesting. And I really like where they're heading too. So there's just this huge range of, you know, various things happening and developing. And it's great to see, you know, people are chipping away, trying to build something now. Absolutely. And now one final uh, point that I did want to ask you about, and we did see that hit headlines this week. And the phrase central bank digital currencies is something that has been going around and circulating and circulating on agendas like ARBCs for, for several years now. But we actually saw that MasterCard has launched a central bank digital currency testing platform, enabling central banks to access and explore these national digital currencies. And I want to get your, your insights because you are a really sure. an advocate for kind of breaking down for uh, the regular person in layman's terms, what this kind of thing actually means. A positive and a negative here, what is your perception of this news? Well, so the, I'll start with the negative first because I think it's interesting to address the fact that trying to maintain everything centrally controlled doesn't bring us to DeFi, it brings us to CFI, which is centralized finance, which is what we've had for years. So they're not really bringing us forward. They're maintaining status quo to protect their business. I mean, that's what any business would do. But the flip side is that if you take a company, let's just take two countries that are unique and don't have a lot of um, exchange rate uh, ability. Like let's say you took Ghana and you took Malaysia. There is no trade pair between Ghana and Malaysia in terms of you know, being able to convert currencies between them. So what you normally have to do is you have to go through an intermediary currency like the dollar which is kind of like what happens for a lot of us in Bitcoin. If you want to get from one coin to another, you go through Bitcoin or you go through Ether. But mm -hmm. if you started to create a centralized platform to allow multiple countries to open up their currencies to a more open market where they could trade more freely or to move currency between them, that would be interesting. I don't think that's what MasterCard's intending, but that certainly could be an unexpected outcome. I think what MasterCard's goal was, was to find ways to create a payment rails that would be enabling a variety of countries to use their central bank digital currencies to do the same thing that their normal currencies do, which just means it's a technology play and nothing more than that. It doesn't actually mean they're going to centralized or decentralized anything. They're just trying to move from the current MasterCard and Visa payment rails environment, which is all based on databases and networks to a different model based on something that might be pseudo blockchain or digital, but it probably would enable better transactions for a lot of countries to um, offer more services. So it's certainly a MasterCard play for, you know, domination and business, but it's maintaining a centralized environment, which is probably not what people want to hear. And just and based on your knowledge in, in the sector and how you see the industry actually moving forward, when it comes to at integration of this, I mean, we've seen central bank digital currency testing from different companies several times now, and it has been enough to make headline news, but in the crypto yeah. and blockchain space, but is it something that you're actually expecting to be integrated in the next five years? Or is it something where actually it is a tough nut to crack? It is a very large sector. Um, is MasterCard capable of such a thing? Well, I mean, MasterCard has the money and they have the technology capability. Are they hiring, you know, a variety of blockchain database and other probably And they're, you know, I'm sure if we looked at the website, we'd probably find all the jobs they're hiring. So they certainly have the capacity to do it if they put the money to it and they actually start building um, wh what they would build. I don't know, but in five years easily, um, because there are already, you know, blockchain projects that are trying to cross the chasm between traditional uh, financial transactions and, you know, crypto. And you even, you see some of the, you know, elements of that. If you look at people like BitPay or WireX, where you can take Bitcoin Ether and convert it to euros or dollars or pounds and then spend them in shops. So you're really talking about just one step easier in that transactional, you know, model. Um, and I suppose it's probably not as technically hard as it is more the willingness of companies to get involved and do it. So, Within five years, it could easily be done. 
It's just a question of what the objective is and where that takes us in terms of a decentralized versus a centralized world. We're probably going to live in both, to be honest. You know, we'll probably have some centralized and some some decentralized. I don't see everything going decentralized because it takes a lot of willingness from a lot of people to accept having full control and ownership of their own money. And it's bad enough that, you know, most people can't remember where the keys are in their house. Imagine asking them to keep the keys to their wallets for their money safe. Big challenge. So there's going to be hybrids, no doubt about that. It's going to evolve. It's going to keep evolving. And I think the market has spoken and said, this is what we want. So companies will either expand and evolve and acquire, or they'll just become obsolete. And we'll just have to, to wait and see it and watch as it unfolds Indeed, yeah. as well. Well, Steve, thank you so much for joining me on the line. It's always a pleasure to catch up and hear thank some you. of your insights. Uh, best of luck and looking forward to catching up again very soon. Thank you.